Happy International Women's Day! <laughs> well, that's why we're here, right? We're gathered here today because it is International Women's Day. And it, of course, kickstarts what is the first part of the program um, for the 8th Gender Equality, Wellness, and Leadership Summit held and hosted by the Mutsepi Foundation. My name is Kathy Mutlasana, and I'm going to be your host. On that note, let me welcome our gracious host for this morning. Of course, we're hosted by the Mutsepi Foundation. I'm going to invite onto stage Mrs. Precious Moloi Mutsepe to come and just give us a few remarks in opening the session officially. Let's welcome her. Let's welcome her up as she comes on. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, see such beautiful faces and friends. Thank you for being here. I'm not going to take up too much time. We have a wonderful panel. Thank you so much for agreeing to be with us here today. Um, that will lead us with the discussions. All I want to say is we are here today during opening of the market. It's, we're going to be ringing our bells. And when that time comes, I want you to ring those bells so loud because UNESCO has identified ringing of the bell as significant. It signals fire, it signals crisis, it signals celebration. So today, although we're celebrating International Women's Day, we're also pointing to the crisis of a lack of women, particularly at stock exchanges. So with those few words, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Muloy Mudzebe. On that note, let me welcome our panelists to please join me on stage. I'll kick it off with inviting Busisiwe Mavuso. She's the CEO of Business Leadership South Africa. She is, what I'm going to do in the interest of time is skip the bios. So apologies to all of our panelists, um, just so that I manage the expectations. Up next, I'll also invite Itumileng Munali, the Chief Operating Officer at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Third, Namga Mniki Manga. Mangaliso. She's the senior executive in the presidency. And also joining us virtually is Garabo Mutawung, who's a principal analyst, advocacy and stakeholder relations for the Competition Commission. She'll be joining us virtually. To all our panelists, a very good morning to you and thank you so much for being here for this important conversation. Let's give them a round of applause as we get started. Thank you so much. I think I'll start on the far end of the stage um, with you, Busi. It's 2024. We still are talking about ringing the alarm to signal a crisis of women inclusion, women participation. Why does it feel like we keep having the same conversation over and over again? We also sit in a country where poverty, unemployment, and inequality are the biggest crises that we're actually trying to uh, solve for, as it were. And if we're not going to meaningfully intervene through uh, such programs, through such interventions, through supporting women businesses, you know, we are going to continue experiencing the social instability that you actually have in this country. Social instability that is influenced by the high levels of domestic inequality. So if we were to be deliberate, therefore, as businesses to say that women-led businesses are actually going to be our number one priority, we could be sitting in a totally different country, you know, as it were. Itumeleng, you, of course, um, are representing the JSE, and this is where, I mean, the biggest companies in this country sit, the, li the listed entities, and we are facing the same problem. Those are the companies that Busi is talking about. A stick approach, how would you bring in accountability? Even from the perspective of the JSC, I wonder if you even think it's part of your job. If the whole financial sector is going to enable and empower businesswomen 
and entrepreneurs that are female, it's an ecosystem approach, mm -hmm. right? I think we have interventions at very specific components of the value chain, but then we let them down later on. I'll give you an example. So for, for, for businesses to thrive, first you must have SME programs, you must have accelerator programs, and then you must help them scale, and not just scale nationally, but globally, right? Because those are the sustainable companies going forward. But then on top of that, there are different parts of the financial ecosystem that must play in synchrony. The banks, it's not just the, the, the stock exchange, but banks in terms of funding, private equity firms, asset managers, brokerage firms. There's, an, there's a myriad of players in addition to the regulatory side of the business, um, the ecosystem that enables businesses to thrive. I think we do really, really well. There's so many SME programs out there. Namsa, let me come to you. Busi has basically said, if there is to be any change, then policy is what's going to bring it, and we need a stick approach. What's the views of the presidency? And of course, in many ways, uh, she's saying, well, government to an extent is not doing its job. What's the point of having policy if it's not going to be monitored, if it's not going to be policed? Well, thank you for that question, um, and good morning to everyone. I think that the, the starting point of the presidency, and I'm here also representing the Women Economic Assembly, my co-chair Mefuti Mtoba is here as well. And I think where we started off when we were thinking about women's economic empowerment is what gender transformed economies would look like. Mm -hmm. And essentially for us, what that meant is that we needed to find ways of ensuring that women have agency in the market. Agency means decision-making power and space. Decision-making power and space is enabled by the ownership of means of production, right? And so we're not just talking about women in terms of the numbers of how many women are employed in a particular sector. We're talking about women to the extent that they own manufacturing systems, they own businesses, etc. And I think the work that we've begun to do in the marketplace was to actually take more of a collaborative approach mm -hmm. to say, how can we work with industry to ensure that more and more women own businesses are actually operating in sectors. So South Africa has about 17 different economic sectors, as it were. And within those sectors, one of the shockers for me was the fact that most of South Africa's economy is actually owned by four or five large corporations per sector, mm -hmm. which essentially means that localization and ownership is very, very difficult. The reason why what Busi is, is saying is so important around supply chains and value chains is that the only chance we have of owning South Africa's productive system is to ensure that more women own businesses in those sectors, whether it's energy, whether it's automotives, whether it is manufacturing or textiles. But we have to take a much more intentional, technical approach to understand what is the value chain for each of the 17 sectors? Where are the opportunities that women-owned businesses can enter that space, number one? Number two, be supported to actually begin to operate in that space. So then ecosystems of support, such as financing, enterprise development become critical. Mm -hmm. Some of the work we've done in the Women Economic Assembly is to actually take this approach. So the partnership is with the public sector, the private sector, and women business owners themselves, entrepreneurs. And that tripartite allow, uh, alliance is allowing us to go to each industry and say, what can you commit to by way of targets in terms of offtake agreements. Our keyword, our buzzword is offtake agreements. No, enterprise development is beautiful, but if it ends before the point where there's an offtake agreement, in other words, a supplier contract, it's not doing its job. And so one of the things we must ring the bell about for here, it's to move and say, how do we ensure that more and more of those women-owned businesses are actually getting supplier contracts mm -hmm. so that they can begin to operate in the space. The last thing I'll say before I hand back over to you, Chair, is that the manufacturing capacity of women is critical. If we're looking at an economy that's underproducing, we are underproductive as an economy. Part of that is because we don't have the manufacturing capacity, the manufacturing infrastructure. Mm -hmm. This is where the public sector comes in, actually. So the role of DTIC, DB, um, uh, the Department of Small Business Development, is to say, how do we ensure that we've got that manufacturing capacity, not just in the city centers, but in rural spaces where women can come together and actually begin to manufacture whatever it is they can. Mm -hmm. An example 
in KZN, there are women who produce cotton. There's nothing they can do with that cotton except to sell it to some middle person who's usually a white guy who then sells it to India and China. One of the things we must change is that in KZN, in their rural area, we must build a scouring factory right there so that those women are taking their primary product, they are manufacturing or processing it, and then reselling it to the South African market. Karabo, let me bring you in and just a reminder that you are muted, so don't forget to unmute yourself as you start talking. You, of course, have the opportunity of really getting into the balance sheets of big deals that are taking place in this country. You have a view of not only what is happening in these businesses, but also where is that anti-competitive behavior coming in and why is it that we continue to see women shut out and to what extent are we seeing that intentionality to bring in women where there are deals of significance? Good morning, Kathy, and good morning to the uh, panel members. We need to be intentional about how we bring women uh, 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 into the into the picture. I always say, I mean, uh, you know, competition authorities, Busi spoke about the stick, right? So we have a stick uh, and the soft up and the carrot on, on our side, right? And these are some of the tools that competition authorities have. And so, for example, similar with mergers, right? Uh, when we when we um, look at enforcement cases, uh, competition authorities have the ability to impose remedies, right? And essentially, these remedies really are meant to um, to correct or offset any harm that has that has that has been caused by the anti-competitive conduct. And again, here, Kathy, you know, there's an opportunity for competition authorities to use their remedies to be able to empower women, right? So, for example, we may want to have a remedy that says um, to the firms, create funds for example, that are going to uh, benefit women in a particular sector. And we may want to look at those sectors where uh, men um, are, are dominating in those sectors, right? We may want to look at construction. We may want to look at energy, you know, and so impose uh, remedies, uh, you know, that seek to provide technical training and skills support to women, you know, that are enterprise, supply and enterprise uh, development uh, driven, you know, which is a point that, that Busi made earlier. So the only thing is that we all need to be intentional. And I love what, uh, uh, what Namsha said, you know, is that we are all acting in our silos and it is not going to be impactful. We need to be able to come together and say, how can we together, you know, as public uh, service entities, bring about this change that we want to see. All right. Karabo, thank you so much for that and for your contribution. Mam Nolita, I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> you have had the opportunity of working across industry. You understand what the private sector needs. And because of the nature of your work, you've had to understand what the public sector needs. So... If we are to truly mean what we say, even as women, in conversations like this, what do we also need to start doing differently? Where do we begin with the streamlining? Because if we leave it open-ended, nothing is ever going to happen. Nothing is going to change. Thank you. Um, Kathy, I think... You, you, you deal with uh, elders differently, so that, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, 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 that's, that, that is welcome. I, I, I believe uh, if women who are in every sphere of governance or business or organization do not take their fiduciary duty seriously to be governance experts and also change agents, then we're not going to see this happen because you could be one woman in a boardroom, but if you know what the legislation is saying, then you say to your own colleagues in that boardroom, why are we not compliant? So you do call each other out. So it's important that we all mm -hmm. each become change agents. We all become bell, uh, bell ring ringers. Mm -hmm. uh, bell, <laughs> is it bell, bell ringers. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of school, bell ringers <laughs> who, who, who sound the alarm mm -hmm. 
in within the boardroom that you are in, you must sound the alarm outside and say, we are not doing well. Do not wait until there's a crisis. We know there is a crisis, but we really truly have got to be the change agents that make sure that these things change systemically and also sustainably. All right. Thank you for that contribution. Pussy? Kathy, I just want to add to the question that you have just asked because I really think that it's critical, you know, to say what are we doing or what do we have to do as, as, as women as well. So there is two pieces of it, you know, uh, uh, for me, and it may Leng raise the one piece to say that while you continue to sit in organizations that are not largely led and represented by women, it becomes a problem because the conversations that are being held in those boardrooms are about us without us. So Stead says that you need to have at least 30% representation for you to be able to make a significant influence. And you don't have 30% representation in corporate South Africa's boardrooms at least. So that is the one piece. But the second piece, the most important one for me, is that when we do then ascend to these boardrooms and we hold these positions, as women, what do we do with that power? You see, you can't come into that real room and be a seat warmer and be a bench warmer <laughs> and maintain the status quo. It, it, you, 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 you know, we, we really have to get to a point where we are comfortable with power and many of us are not. And power for its own sake is useless. It has to be power for empowerment. You have to come in there and rattle the cage and ask conversations that are uncomfortable because you are privy to certain information and you are part of the decisions that a business is making. And the reason why you're being brought into the room is for you to give a different lens and a different perspective because you are likely coming into a boardroom which is white and male. So a black woman's voice, a woman's voice, therefore becomes critical because you're engaging with things from a totally different perspective. Mm -hmm. And if we are not going to do that when we do occupy these positions, we're going to continue having this conversation. And unfortunately, we are depriving South Africa from getting full participation from a big segment of society mm -hmm. by not rattling the cage when it comes to the gender agenda. And, and the fact that... Sure, go ahead. <laughs> the fact that when people are in boardrooms and do want to speak up. They feel alone, they feel unsupported. And at the end of the day, we all have bills to pay. So what becomes the consequence of that speaking out? Are we providing enough support to women who are in key positions in industry so that they know that when they do speak up, when they do raise their voice, they won't be alone? You know. We, 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 we probably maybe often that thing that the support is not there. And I really think that if I look at my own career trajectory, I mean, I've spoken about Menolita being my board member. I know that I've got a supporter in her. I know that I've got a supporter in my chair, Nukulu Lego Nyembis. I know that I've got supporters from all my board members, especially women. I know that I've got support from so many other women leaders whom I haven't met yet. But even if that is the case, even if you are worried about the support thing, you see, leadership is precisely about doing what it... it, it you're supposed to be taken out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. So you don't deserve, therefore, to be in that seat if you are going to go in there, you know, and be apologetic about raising issues because you are worried <laughs> that you are actually going to. Sometimes, <laughs> because you, you're raising legitimate issues. <laughs> you're raising legitimate issues. And maybe the question that we can talk about is probably maybe not the what you ask, because comfortable, uncomfortable questions you have to ask, but maybe find a way of asking them in such a manner that they don't come across as offensive. I'm not sure how to do that, but still, <laughs> you know, for those who are diplomatic enough, you know, they can actually, but we have, Kathy, if we are not going to do that, then honestly, we're wasting our time. They might just well shut us out of these boardrooms if we're not going to make a change. All right, thank you for that, Busi. We're getting ready to wrap this conversation up. Itumileng, your closing remarks. Um, thank you, Kathy. I, I think it's a really, really pertinent question around you know, how do we rattle cages, et cetera. And part of leadership, um, as you kind of go through your career and ascend, is getting to a place where you've unshackled yourself to the point that you can actually freely be a change agent. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, you know, you, we have bills to pay, et cetera. Our responsibility is to look after ourselves so well that when we go out there and we have to fight hard battles, 
we don't necessarily feel exposed, right? So part of that is financial freedom. Part of that is having a support system, an ecosystem of other people, and they don't all have to be women. But it's very, very important that that happens. Just a side um, um, comment that's very important. I really wish that most of the investment decisions in this country were made by women. Because as a country, we would be much wealthier than we currently are. The statistics bear it out. Um, studies have been done, and women have been consistently proven to be much more risk conscious in a responsible way. Um, they leave their investments alone. They're not speculative about, it. I heard this thing, and I'm going to just get on it while from the, you know, while it's early, etc. That's how money is lost. Um, women are better at letting go when they should. Women are, bit, are less likely to hop onto fads, right? And we've seen this. So I guess for me, it's we have a job to do in boosting the confidence of women in doing these things. It's, it's ironic that women make better investment decisions. However, they are less confident in entering the world of investment mm -hmm. simply because of, of a predisposed bias of, of some sort. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that we do to support women financially, to support women in terms of their mental wellness, in terms of their leadership development. But again, the ecosystem comes into play. So there are so many dimensions of us as women. And we sit here and we're talking about ourselves as business women. Yeah. And you know, when you show up through a door, but before you show up through the door, there's so much more to make sure that that person is fully supported and showed up so that they can show up in the world as a confident woman. Our job is not to outmen men. Our, our job is to be unique in what we bring as females to any environment. And we've shown ev with empirical data that that is true. Um, it would be laughable, right, if we asked men to behave like women. They'd laugh at us. Mm -hmm. And yet, for some reason, we walk into the world trying to outmen them. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not the solution. So for us, representativity is about the uniqueness that women bring, All right. the qualities that they do as well. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for that. Namsa? Three very quick points. I think the first one is um, I completely agree with um, the strategies around how do we use policy better, how do we leverage the stick approach better. I also, though, want to bring our attention to the approach of co-creation, the assumption of goodwill. When we went to the automotive industry in South Africa and we began to ask how many women do, do you have, they gave us the Automotive Industry Transformation Fund. And they said they are, um, you know, um, using that fund, six billion, to actually ensure that there's transformation in the industry. When we went to talk to the Automotive Transformation Fund, we gave them a list of targets, things to aim for, to achieve. What we asked them for was 30% of the allocation of six billion to women-owned enterprise, enterprises. What we got to date is by far about 60% of what they have funded so far is women-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. What we're finding is that there, are good, there is good will that is untapped in industry, where if we come with intelligent approaches of the how to give the solution, how do we do it? Yes, we know what we want to do. Yes, we're a board, we've made the decision. Give us a system of how we do it. Our gender transformative approach, the indicators in the system we're using, has allowed them to say this is where we can put this money, including ensuring that women now have a car dealerships. So let's be much more proactive on those co-creation tapping into goodwill. Right. The second one I think, which is I, very very important as well, is about identifying champions in spaces. I mean, we're talking about how difficult it is to be at executive leadership. We know this in the public sector because everywhere it's brutal for women. But you know, what I find is that once we can find those champions Champions at, uh, champions at executive level that can come together so that across spaces, across systems, across, um, across the barriers, we're breaking those barriers so that we can work collaboratively together. And then we don't forget the big picture. 
One of the things that helps me to wake up in the morning and do the hard work is because I know that gender-transformed economies are good for this nation. This is my patriotism, that as long as I push this agenda, it's better for my children, and I have two sons. It's better for our economy. Right. And so keeping the eye on that goal, I think, helps us to focus on what needs to be done. Namsa, thank you so much for those contributions. All right, I'm now going to ask you to give a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you so much for your contributions and your insights this morning. I'm going to invite all of our esteemed bell ringers for this morning to come onto the stage as we get ready for the opening bell. <laughs> there we go. Ten. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Thank you so much.